Over the billions of years that this planet has been in existence, it has seen many species come and go. It's estimated that around 99.9% .9 of all species that have ever existed are now extinct, and the average lifespan of a species is around 1 to 10 million years. It can be a very sad occurrence when a species does go extinct, and it's even worse when there's nothing we can do about it. Some species can go extinct very quickly through overhunting or habitat destruction, whereas others decline very slowly over time, until eventually you have an endling. An endling is the last known individual of a species or a subspecies, and once the endling dies, the species becomes extinct. Of course this isn't always the case, because sometimes endlings have died, only for more of its species to be found in the wild years later. Over the past few hundred years there have been some very famous endlings, and today I'll be going through just a few of them, as I will be going through three of the most famous endlings over the past few hundred years. To start off our story we can head to North America, and we will be focusing on the birds of North America. There are many interesting birds that can be found across the continent, whether they be native or introduced. Some introduced birds can look quite out of place, such as the monk parakeet, the rose-ringed parrot, and the red-masked parakeet. These birds almost look out of place in a colder climate. Yet there was once a parakeet that was native to the USA. The Carolina parakeet is a now extinct species of neotropical parrot, and it once had a very striking coloration. It was known for its bright yellow head and reddy orange face, and was a very striking member of the US ecosystem. It was the only indigenous parrot throughout its range, and was mostly found in the southeastern United States. It really is a shame that these birds aren't around today, because they would have made a truly amazing sight. They were found in huge noisy flocks that could be anywhere up to 300 birds, and they would spend their days feeding on the seeds of forest trees, and also shrubs. Surprisingly, this diet had an added side effect, as it was thought that the Carolina parakeet was actually poisonous. It was noted by an American naturalist that cats used to die after eating them, and this was because they were known to eat the toxic seeds of cockleburs. When they were first described, their true population was unknown, and was thought to be anywhere from tens of thousands of birds to a few million birds. As the European settlers arrived and colonised the continent, these colourful birds slowly started to disappear. The Carolina parakeet was most at home in swampy areas, and a lot of these areas were being deforested in the 18th and 19th centuries. As well as this, they were hunted for the decorative use of their feathers, and even though some farmers valued them as they ate cockleburs, which were an invasive poisonous plant, they were also hated by many other farmers too. They would happily feed on crops, and as they were found in such large numbers, they could quickly decimate vineyards and orchards. This led to a very steady decline of the Carolina parakeet, and eventually there was only one left. This parakeet was known as Incas, and resided in the Cincinnati Zoo. He lived in the same enclosure that once held Martha, who was also the endling of her own species. Incus was brought to Cincinnati Zoo in 1885, and this was in an attempt to establish a captive breeding population. He was purchased along with 15 other birds at the sum of $40, which is the equivalent of $1,200 in today's money. Some of these parrots were also shipped around the world, with some ending up in London Zoo. Incus was eventually paired with a female Carolina parakeet by the name of Lady Jane. They were successful in laying eggs over 32 years together, but they consistently rolled the eggs from their nest. Lady Jane eventually passed away in the summer of 1917, and keepers at the zoo noted that Incus had become listless and mournful. After a cold spell hit Cincinnati in 1918, Incus eventually passed away, putting an end to the California parakeet. And personally, I think it really is a shame that these colourful birds aren't found in the US anymore. But for our next species, we will be heading south to central Panama, as we have Rab's fringe-limbed tree frog. Now strangely, this species isn't currently listed as extinct, as it's actually listed as critically endangered, but possibly extinct. These frogs were once found in the forest canopies of central Panama, and were even capable of gliding with their enormous webbed feet. Males were known for being very territorial and would guard waterholes, and their tadpoles would feed on the skin cells of their fathers. This makes this species a relatively caring frog, but unfortunately they may be no more. This frog preferred cloud forest environments, and these environments can often seem otherworldly. Even high up in the trees they couldn't escape their doom, as they fell victim to something that is wiping out amphibian species worldwide. Citrid fungus is wiping out amphibian species at an astonishing rate, and it could be the cause of many more extinctions to come. Once an amphibian contracts this fungus, it almost always proves to be fatal, and that was the case for many of these frogs. The last known living Rab's fringe-limbed tree frog was known as Tuffy, and he lived in the Atlanta Botanical Garden in Georgia. 
While he lived there, he had a few tadpoles with a female, but unfortunately none of these survived. After the female died, the only other known living specimen was a male, and Tuffy had no other options of reproducing. The other male died in February 2012, and later on Tuffy met his end in September 2016. There is still some hope that there might be some of these frogs still out there, but for now it looks like Tuffy was an endling after all. But for our final species, we will be moving over to Australia, because we will be focusing on possibly the most famous endling of them all, as I will be taking a look at the thylacine. The thylacine also goes by the name of Tasmanian tiger or Tasmanian wolf, but of course it was not closely related to either of them. And the thylacine was more closely related to kangaroos and koalas than it was to dogs or cats. In fact, one of the thylacine's closest living relatives doesn't look anything like it at all, and looks almost like a marsupial version of a mouse. The thylacine mostly hunted at night and was an ambush predator. Famously, it could open its mouth to a 120 degree angle, and this would help it catch and dispatch its prey, which mostly came in the form of birds and also small to medium sized mammals. Like many other Australian creatures, the thylacine was a marsupial, and strangely, both the male and the female had pouches. Strangely, the male's pouches covered their testicles and it's thought that this pouch came in handy when it was bitterly cold. The story of the thylacine's decline is quite a complicated one. There are many different factors, and different people seem to blame different things. Of course, us humans played a role, but it's thought that before we interfered, the dingo was already taking over. The thylacine would directly compete with the dingo, and because the dingo was so much larger, it could easily overpower the thylacine. And the thylacine's range slowly started to decrease. Not only did humans introduce dingoes to Australia, but later on when the Europeans arrived, they directly hunted the thylacine both for sport and to protect their livestock. The thylacine would hunt chickens and sheep, and at one point there was a one pound bounty on the thylacine's head. In all, the government paid out 2,184 bounties, and this eventually led to their extinction. The Tasmanian government decided to start protecting these mammals 59 days before they disappeared, and of course this was too little too late. The last known individual known as Benjamin called Hobart Zoo home, but eventually died on the 6th of September 1936. Out of all the recent extinctions over the past few hundred years, the extinction of the thylacine seems to hit hardest, simply because it was such a beautiful and unique creature. It's also one of the few extinct creatures that we still have footage of, and although the thylacine is no longer with us, at least it still lives on through images and stories. Of course there are plenty of other famous endlings, and I'm more than happy to do a part 2, so if you know any let me know down in the comments below, and if you want to see a part 2, also let me know in the comments below. But thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed, if you liked it please leave a like, and subscribe if you want to see more videos like these, but until next time, goodbye.